Welcome back to another episode of a mental health break with Vincent A. Lancey. I'm Vincent A. Lancey, speaker, coach, and author of the book, Mr. Lancey Talks Mental Health. And I'm Stephen Fage. When I was 21 years old, I was the victim of a hit and run accident. After coming out of a coma and suffering from a traumatic brain injury, or you may know of as a TBI, I soon realized that it was time to put my mental health on a very high pedestal. This transformative experience has led me to create a podcast that is all things mental health. It has also led me to create my new book, Mr. Lancey Talks Mental Health. Be sure to check that book out on my website after the episode ends. Would it add value to your life to hear mental health professionals and advocates share their authentic stories relating to mental health? If you answered yes, you came to the right place. I want to start by congratulating you for making your mental health a priority. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the show five stars and continue listening by subscribing. Today's guest is someone who is supporting my content, and once I looked into his profile, I realized the value he could bring to the show. He is a mental health advocate with firsthand experiences to share to help you thrive. After being on his own mental health journey for much of his life, he started sharing his story to give back to others. Stephen has been on a journey to overcome a mental illness diagnosis in 11th grade. He is passionate about speaking on his journey in an effort to lift the stigma and raise individuals' emotional intelligence. Someone with a deep understanding and education in psychology, he is also the host of the podcast, My Niche is Human, which also delves deep into many mental health-related areas. I've had a few great chats with Stephen before we hopped on, and I am excited for you all to learn the stuff that I have. So allow me to now introduce Stephen Fagg. Stephen, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, Vince. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Would you mind please introducing yourself to our listeners and sharing part of your story before we dive in and get going? And also, please do touch on your role relating to mental health. Yeah, of course. Um, So it it all kind of started, like you said, in in 11th grade, that's when reality struck, um, coming home with that diagnosis and and everything changed. Um, But, you know, just trying to be a normal, air quotes, normal human ever since then. Uh, But you know, you learn through the journey that trying to be normal or, or trying not to be your diagnosis, it ends up defining you. Uh, so I, I guess my role really is to share my story uh, and hope that it inspires other people to share theirs. I think it absolutely will. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show again. And when you were in school, you mentioned you got this diagnosis in 11th grade. Was there any education that was relevant to this diagnosis in your health and education classes oh my gosh no 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 if, if anything uh it wasn't talked about at all it was the opposite uh you're afraid to bring up being sad depressed having a bad day uh everything i did was running from that because i didn't want to appear to be you know air quotes messed up or air quotes crazy you know how it is in high school you don't want people to think oh that's the crazy kid uh-huh. he's so bipolar you know, it was even kind of a, a slang <laughs> saying. Uh, so it was the opposite. It was the opposite. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I couldn't agree with you more. When I was in school, I can't really remember any specific conversation relating to any health above the neck. So I think conversations exactly. like ours will continue to break that stigma. But thank you again for sharing that, Stephen. On each episode, I share a mental health story of someone who is famous because I want to let you, the listeners, know you are not alone. I want you to understand that even though someone looks like they are healthy from the outside, they may not be on the inside too. For today's episode, I will introduce the mental health related story of an actor who many know from his roles in both The Big Bang Theory and Star Trek The Next Generation in Will Wheaton. I would like to start this right up in saying this article is a perfect example of how although he is famous and you see him on TV every night, He is just like you and I. He is a husband, a father, and an author, a best-selling one at that, yet he still struggles with mental health disparities. Will's mental health challenges started when he was just seven or eight years old as he started having panic attacks. Back then, 
panic attacks were not a thing, and he was just told he was having nightmares. I learned that he would sleep on the floor in his sister's room because he was afraid to be alone. Although he did have many normal moments as a child, his panic attacks persisted. They kept returning and was always worse than the one before. This led to self-esteem and confidence issues, as many of you can imagine, as he was a teenager, and he felt like he could not trust anyone because he was convinced that people only wanted to be around him for his fame, considered himself worthless without it. Whenever he wanted to have fun with his friends, he felt like his anxiety would stop him from doing so. Even traffic would become too stressful, and he would have trouble finding parking because of that mentality. Stephen, what do you take away from this story or any of his statements on mental health? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is permission to be where you're at, whether it's good, bad, or, or otherwise. Um, you said back then panic attacks didn't really exist. Uh, <laughs> not being allowed to feel as bad as you feel. Um, I have this theory that uh, the lack of acceptance can often be worse than the original symptoms or the original uh, issue. So I love that's, that. That's rough. Yeah, I mean, I think, and it's again, he got diagnosed at a similar age to you. He was feeling similar things where he didn't want to speak out and it would even have him trouble to hang out with his closest friends. Is that something you dealt with as well? 100%. Uh, it's easier to just be alone uh, and not have to act, not have to put on the mask. Uh, everyone's familiar with the idea of wearing a mask. Problem with that is it it gets worse. You know, you be alone to make it easier, but then you realize how easy it is to be alone. And then it exacerbates the issue. You stop connecting with people. You stop socializing. Uh, and it only gets worse. Thank you for sharing all that. I think we're going to talk about that a little more in detail today. And I'm excited to add value to our listeners through your great story. Very inspiring, Stephen. Let's get into the main event here. On each episode, my guest and I will go over this series of six questions to help others improve their mental health. You ready to go? Let's do it. Great. So many would agree that the more common or talked about types of mental health disparities are mood disorders, anxiety disorders, or schizophrenia disorders. Which areas did you come across the most in your experiences? So for me, the I think it, I, I started seeing someone. Uh, because what my parents saw and understood was changed behavior slash depression. And back then, those were the Prozac days where you were either depressed or you were fine. Uh, you know, unless it was really dark. You know, I heard, used to hear stories about, um, you know, my parents' parents' generation coming back from the war. There was PTSD, schizophrenia, a lot of alcoholism, and everything that came with that. I think the point I want to make with this is the challenge with these labels, and if any of your listeners have read the DSM-4, now it's DSM-5, it's the textbook for mental illness diagnosis um, and all the descriptions that go with it. The challenge with that is I don't believe any one person is any one thing. And mental health professionals, I don't think they want this, but I feel like the challenge for them is they almost want to be able to label it so they can give you a medication to address it. But the, the real challenge is it, it's really a mix. There are no vacuums. You are not just depressed because depression can cause anxiety. And then you have anxiety because you're anxious or because you're depressed. So they, they all really mix together. Um, so I would say, you know, what I've come across from my experience in talking to a lot of other people is I don't know how to label it because there is no label. And I'm not trying to be too philosophical, but it's just what you are, where you're at. What is your trauma? How did you digest that? How did you imprint that into habits, values, beliefs? And then how do you unpack that rather than saying, you are depressed, you should do X, Y, Z. You are anxious. You, you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think it could even translate to what happened with me is traumatic brain injury, where there's a general diagnosis of TBI. But in everybody's brain is so different and so unique. There is not one brain that is similar to, and maybe similar, but nowhere near exact. So what happened to Steven and watching his case study may be completely different for me. I don't have much psychology background through speaking to others here. 
I have gathered that something people can do is just learn more about the underlying factors, learning as much about what's going on as possible to give you a correct diagnosis. Do you think that makes more sense? Absolutely. Um, I just did an episode last week uh, with a friend of mine. She's seeking her PhD in psychology. Uh, and it was the same. It, it's a matter of, so the topic was PTSD. And my question was, but what if they don't tell you all the things that you need to see to check your boxes to give them a PTSD diagnosis? And she said, that's a very real thing. A lot of people who are in that situation are in denial. They can't accept that they've either been exposed to or they have the trauma as a result. So testing, understanding, pulling out the information. I, I mean, I used to say you can't get a blood test for bipolar. Maybe you can. I'm not. Don't quote me on that. But that's what I used to say. Um, because it's I'm like, well, what if I filled out that test different? What if I said things in a different way? Um, hope that answered the question. I, I, but I think that's a, a big challenge. I think it world. answered the question and then some. So thank you for such a thorough answer that will obviously help our listeners that much more. But you may have previewed it a bit here, Stephen. When did you first decide that taking a stance on mental health advocacy or a career relating to mental health was going to be the right path for you? Do you have a moment to share with us? Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not trying to sound highfalutin, but I think it happened before I realized it. Um, thinking back when I was 18, I gave a car on my birthday. I gave a card to my parents and I said, Thank you for basically sending me to counseling. Thank you for being there, paying attention, not just letting me fall down the hill. Uh, and I remember telling my mother, I said, this diagnosis is not going to be my crutch. It is not going to be my handicap. And it is not, air quotes, going to define me, which it did, which is fine. But I, I said, this is going to be my, my gift. If I can see a wider spectrum, very high, very low, I feel like I can maybe see more than other people. And I want to take that information and share it with them in a very constructive way. And then, you know, years went on of medication, self-medicating, uh, dark, dark years. But now at this age, it's, it's coming together, realizing that I'm at a state of maturity, I guess, to be able to share, uh, to share the rest, I guess. Yeah. So it started back then. Yeah. A lot of people listening on are going to be in the shoes you were in and one thing I can share is because I'm looking at you right now, how well you're doing, you're looking great here. And it's a great testament to just as he's saying, maturing, realizing what's going on around you, and then taking those preventative steps. But before you could take steps here, you might realize there's something going on here, something going on mentally, what advice can you give to our listeners as why maybe consider the potential early sign that they may be developing a mental illness again, from your experiences? Everyone's so different. I, I would say, I think I can speak to how I manage myself now best because back then uh, I didn't know what was going on. Uh, well, back then I would say it was a drastic change in behavior. Uh, and a lot of that was drug related. A lot of that was uh, skipping school. So I would say change behavior. We, we talk about this a lot. So if you're always working out and then you're not working out anymore, if you're always eat, eating healthy and then you stop, even something as simple as you've stopped making your bed or you've stopped brushing your teeth, right? I, I know someone listening right now can relate to that. You've gone days without brushing your teeth. Why? Because you just don't care. So those are maybe stretches of a bad day. Maybe you got fired from your job, but does, does that necessarily mean you have a mental illness? I'm sure a lot of people would say probably not. Um, so how do you, I mean, this is a question that I am exploring myself. How do we know if we're having a stretch of bad days or when to go seek help? And uh, to reference that, that last episode, um, Taryn mentioned, use your support system. They are your best mirror. They have the most contrast. Uh, there are many of us who can suffer a bad day. We can suffer bad years. Um, Maybe you have something that you're toughening through, but your friends will say, hey, maybe you should go get help. You don't have to be miserable. There are no trophies for being miserable. You know, there are a lot of cultures growing up. It was like almost a badge for being able to make it through misery. You don't have to be that way. So silly analogy, kind of like getting a tattoo. Wait six months. If you still want it in six months, go get it. Uh, if you have a bad day, tough through it. If it's an extended amount of time, this is tough to speak to, you know, because it's different for everybody. But um, that, that's a tough question, Vince. That, that is the question. 
Hey, you did a great job in answering it. And of course, everybody is different. But like I said, someone is going through what you went through and your courage to speak on your story here is going to go a long way, Stephen. And I think that is very true. If you're not feeling yourself for an extended period of time, speak to a professional, speak to someone who cares about you. He mentioned support systems. They are very crucial to any success, not just professionally, but physically, emotionally, spiritually. If you don't have positive people in your circle where you can count on them for support, I think it's time to reevaluate who's in that close circle of yours because just as you need to be supportive for others, you also need to be supportive of yourself and having the right people around you can go a long way. So you mentioned positive friends. Uh, I'd like to add to that, the friend who's going to give it to you straight, Mm -hmm. not the friend who's going to say, yeah, it's cool. You'll make it. You're doing fine. You're doing great. It's no, you're screwing up right now. You're messing up. You're not taking care of yourself. You deserve better. You shouldn't be in that, you know, someone who's just going to give it to you straight and not care about hurting your feelings in a loving way kind of thing. That's you couldn't be more right. You need people that are going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear, because the longer you hear what you want to hear, it can make things worse. So thank you for adding that, Stephen. If you could pick three, and I say just three, because I want the three most important things our listeners can do on a daily or short-term basis to improve their mental health, what can you offer? I'd say the first one, uh, they're obviously all biased. First one is make your bed. There, are, there was an excellent uh, commencement speech by a military officer who gave this on YouTube. Look it up. Google, make your bed, uh, commencement speech. Uh, but the point is there's a lot of science behind that. It puts your brain into a task-oriented mode. Um, I do it for that reason, but the biggest reason is I'm a firm believer in gratitude. That could be number two, but mm-hmm. we're still on number one. Gratitude is not something you just say. It's something you do. And starting your day by making your bed is saying, thank you for giving me four walls, a blanket. I'm not afraid while I'm sleeping. It's safety. It's all the things built in. uh, I love that one. William McRaven's. It's an unbelievably inspiring start. And it's the little things you do in life in general that will propel you forward. So that's a great number one. I got to be excited for number two now. Love it. Uh, Number two is is less sexy. It's breathe. The truth. So the the most impactful things you can do, I believe are the least sexiest. It's the most boring. It's water, healthy food, go for a walk. You know, it's, you see all these things on LinkedIn and it's these big elaborate lists. And I don't comment. I don't want to be the sarcastic guy who's like, yeah, don't forget water, food and exercise, but it's so critical. Uh, So number two is breathe, whether it's, so the idea of meditation can be very intimidating and that's probably a whole that's a whole nother episode if you want it to be, um, <laughs> but simply sitting there taking two deep breaths, uh, it's huge. It, and there's all kinds of science behind it, uh, but we'll make this summarize. So make your bed, breathe, and go for a walk. Um, it gets you outside. It can be meditative. It gets your blood flowing. It gets you away from work. It causes a pause. And do not bring your headphones. Smell the air listen to the trees, listen to the birds. I mean, it, it, it makes you present, count your steps if you have to. Um, there's a lot to be said about bringing yourself to center. Um, I, could, I could talk for an hour on that, but short list. Make well, your bed, I love breathe, what you said there forward. with taking a walk without your phone. You're the second person out of the whole show um, who's ever said that. And the other one is Dr. Richard Basio. He's in my new book, Mr. Lancey Talks Mental Health. And he said, Vin, just go for a walk, take in the birds chirping, the lawnmowers maybe, just the, just the sounds of peace and relax and get away from that phone. Those are all great things. Breathing exercises are free. Walking is free. These things, practicing gratitude, they're all free and they pay an immense value. But those are short-term initiatives. Now we're going to delve a little deeper here with Stephen. What two long-term commitments can our listeners take on to create a healthier mindset? So the first one, uh, it's in the form of, uh, I guess, a product. So long-term, I would say, is write. Don't type. Write with a pen or a pencil. Uh, Something that I've used and talked about quite a bit is a book called The Artist Way. Uh, It's a 12-week course per se in a book. Each chapter 
uh, causes enormous reflection and you dive in, not necessarily through meditation, but through writing every morning, write three pages. You're, I'm sure your listeners have heard of morning pages, uh, write three pages of unfiltered, whatever it's not dear diary. It's not my to-do list. It's, it's whatever comes out. And the goal is to allow the sensor in your mind Give it its way, give it its, you know, give it its due, let it flex. But once it's out of the way, you can spend the rest of your day uh, doing what you want to do. So it helps you both understand where you're at, where you're going, where you're not going, mm-hmm. quite frankly. But it also stokes the inner creative. Uh, it, it causes, if you go through it, I believe it causes quite anyone who goes through this to realize that life is about art and creation and expressing your true self. Uh, and it also helps with the grieving process because once these things click, you're going to realize how much lost time has gone by. Um, but it's, it's an enormous healing journey. It's probably one of the scariest things I've ever done. Uh, so to summarize, I would say, right. Uh, maybe there's a couple built into that. And then the other long-term thing that you can do is figure out what the hell you want to do with your life. You weren't born to clock in and clock out. Um, Many people love their jobs. Many people don't. Um, But have the courage to figure out what it is that makes you happy and take one step towards doing that because it's very, very scary. Uh, It's very hard to recognize the time that has gone by. And for some, so much has gone by, they might figure, ah, why bother? Um, Because it's a very scary thing. It takes a lot of acceptance and a lot of grieving. Um, but I would challenge you to figure out what the hell you want to do and go do it. At least try. As the whole episode has been, that's more great advice. And it's important that you realize by being yourself and doing what you want to do, not what others want you to do, your mental health naturally improves because you're happy expressing, you know, you're not only expressing gratitude, you're writing, you're, you're doing all the things Steven said. Thank you for sharing all that. But what are some ways you plan on raising awareness for the importance of mental health in the future? We touched a little more on your podcast if you want to touch a little more on that. Oh, thank you. So Vince, what's interesting, the thing that I've, the thing that I've figured out, well, so when I started the podcast, um, the thing I didn't want to do is get on the mic and say, here's my five point plan to curbing your anxiety. Like here are, because it doesn't fit. I, I didn't want to be a, a prescriber of recipes. I didn't want to mm-hmm. go in kind of that dynamic of you have a label, here's some medication, take that. You feel anxious, here's five things to do. So at the very beginning, I decided I was not going to do that. And then I said, well, what the hell am I going to do? So the only thing I knew to do was to share my story uh, because paired with that, the idea of imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. who am I to do this? I don't have a PhD, all, all these things. I said, well, what I can do is share my story, my opinion, my experience. I don't need a degree to do that. So then as I shared my story, people contacted me and you're, they're like, wow, that was, I had no idea. And I had grown men, grown industry men c- contacting me, telling me their story, c- certain things that happened to them. I'm speaking carefully here. So I realized the power of story I realized the power of sharing my view of my world. Um, and I say that that way um, because there are a lot of, there's a lot of information out there that's telling you how to live. I say, tell people how I live and let them interpret that and apply it to their situation. Uh, so storytelling, I'm obsessed with, I mean, I got obsessed with Marvel movies for obvious reasons, but the way they tell the story, I have a whole stack of books on, how to tell better stories, because uh, I, I think that's, that's the way. And if you look at um, a little resource for your listener is the mighty, the mighty.com. Uh, there are tons of sections of people sharing their stories with um, all different types of mental health uh, situations. So storytelling. I agree. The power of telling a story not only helps somebody immensely, it just makes you feel good to get it off your chest. You're sharing your story. You're interacting. You're connecting with so many great people. And for me, it's like a therapy session every time I host a mental health podcast. You know, we're talking about everything, ways to improve. So, Stephen, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it very of much. Of course. I know our listeners are going to see all the value in your show. 
I loved how you discussed in an honest testimonial of you starting right in the beginning, even dating back to when it was the Prozac days when there was no help for anybody, but now conversations like ours will help. I also enjoyed here your simple, simple um, short-term initiatives that were also free. And that's something that people can hop off this episode right now and do. I'm obviously a fan of writing as an author. And I like how you ended the show with encouraging people to share their story because of the power in it. But it is time for the last word. And I also do this on my other podcast series, what it's really like to be an entrepreneur, because I want our listeners to really get to know the guests I bring on. Is there something that you would like to share with everyone that we did not get to touch on yet today? Maybe to reiterate, but um, I think the thing that really set me free was the idea of permission. And if you want, if you know, if you, one of your listeners is the nerdy type and they're going to Google instantly, think of permission, think of Robin Williams, think of improv, think of how powerful it is. Once you tell a funny joke or once you tell maybe a vulnerable story. And then all of a sudden the other person's like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like that time I did this really embarrassing thing. The idea of permission is such a powerful thing. Vince, you writing your book, telling your story, you're giving a lot of people permission to be like, Oh wow, he was kind of messed up. I messed up too. And he told the story and he's okay. So that gives me permission to tell my story. That's a great last word, man. You're encouraging people to share their story and it can do a tremendous amount of good. Would you now mind taking the time to please share your professional social media, your website, your podcast, anything you want our listeners to follow your endeavors, request your services. Absolutely. Thank you. So everything is on stevenfage.com, S-T-E-V-E-N-F-A-G-E.com. Same on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, We do have a, uh, I have a Facebook group uh, for the podcast, it's open group. We can share issues related to mental health uh, in the podcast, My Niche is Human, on all the top players. Be sure to check out all of that great content. And it is social media time for the show. And we're on whichever platform you like to use. On LinkedIn, we're at a mental health break with Vincent A. Lancey. On Instagram and Facebook is at a mental health break. And on Twitter, it's at Podcasts by Lancey. So you have updates from this show and what it's really like to be an entrepreneur. If you check out any of my books, DM me. I would love to hear from you all and repost your support. We have Mr. Lancey Talks Mental Health, Left for Dead, A Story of Redemption, and How to Transform Your Mindset When the Norm is Changed, all are on my website now, which is vincentalancey.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the show five stars and continue listening by subscribing. And I'll see you on the next episode of A Mental Health Break with Vincent A. Lancey.